My name is uh, Jose Plendujovic. I'm uh, the relatively new uh, director, uh, faculty and executive director of the Fink Center here at UCLA Anderson. So without further ado, we have uh, Jeff Brown as our uh, moderator. Uh, Jeff Brown is chairman at Ru1 uh, Investments, and I'll let him introduce himself uh, uh, briefly later. Uh, but Jeff is uh, one of our board members uh, at the Fink Center. Uh, he's been a great supporter of, uh, of Anderson and of the university. We have uh, Kelly DePont, who is a managing director at uh, Provitas. We have uh, Steve uh, Royer, uh, a partner at Shamrock. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for being here. And we have uh, Mark Rosenbaum, uh, partner managing director at uh, Aurora Capital uh, Group. So uh, without further ado, Jeff, we'll let you uh, take it away. And let's give them all a round of applause, thanking them for participating. Thank Thank you. How many people here get subscribed to PE Hubwire and read it every day? Okay. Huh? You should. should be everybody. I've been in financial services for 35 years and the last uh, probably decade really dedicated to uh, building private equity firms. Um, and I started reading this and still consider myself a student because there's always something you can read. In today's issue, just want to point out a couple things. Um, Boston Consulting Group came out uh, with a new report and terms us as being in the golden age of private equity, which probably means something's going to go really wrong any day now, uh, so stay tuned. But a couple of the interesting factoids I came up with, they said um, that private, this is just private equity, so we're not, we're not including private credit, we're not including real estate, which is huge, we're not including infrastructure. Private equity firms globally at the end of 2016 had $2.5 trillion in assets, and, I, and, I, and I'm guessing that's, that's, not, that's not called, that's probably the committed number. Um, and they're saying that almost, there's almost $900 billion of dry powder, meaning money that's ready to be invested, which I think we'd all agree is a, a pretty amazing number. The, the, the thing that um, Jose and I were puzzling over is they go on to say, for those of you who are job seekers, and I'm sure there's a couple here tonight, um, the top five U.S. private equity firms employ nearly one million people, okay? I would love to know where they got that number from because they must be including portfolio companies in that number because that, that would imply firms of 200,000 people and just Newberger Berman that I retired from in September has 2,500 people globally. So there's something wrong with that number. But in any event, interesting stuff, look at it. You should probably all grab the BCG study. I will be trying to download it tomorrow. So. Um, Long-winded introduction, sorry. Take it over, Steve. So I'm uh, Steve Royer. I'm a graduate of Anderson in 1991. Uh, I was a venture capital fellow, and I was placed uh, for my summer program at a little firm called Shamrock Holdings. At the time, it was the Disney Family Investment Company. Um, uh, they, they hired me back. I've been there for 25, 26 years now. Uh, we are now an independent firm. We were separate from the family, but we uh, true to our roots and our heritage, we invest exclusively in media entertainment and communications. So we have uh, a couple of different strategies. Our primary strategy is, uh, is private equity, lower middle market private equity. Um, our current fund is a $700 million fund. And um, we also have a, a new fund that invests in intellectual property rights in the entertainment industry, which by that we really mean uh, content but content libraries, so film libraries, television libraries, music publishing catalogs. Mm. Um, so we're evolving as a firm, growing. We're based right here in LA, and Grady uh, worked for us. Hi, good, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was a 2001 graduate of Anderson. And actually, when I was here, I helped organize this event um, uh, when it was my turn. So it's exciting to be back. After I graduated Anderson, I went to Aurora, and I've been there ever since. So I'm probably somewhat unique in my class to have the same job for 16 years. Um, at Aurora, we are uh, currently investing out of our fifth fund, which we're almost done fundraising. It's about a billion dollars. Uh, we do uh, investing in three verticals um, that are very broad, but they are um, especially manufacturing, uh, industrial services and distribution, and then software and tech-enabled services. And really, our approach is to find good businesses and have a pretty heavy uh, governance and operational involvement to, uh, to grow them. And we also have a, uh, a smaller distress fund uh, called Resurgence uh, that does uh, distress for control, but it's uh, separately managed. Uh, but it's under the Aurora umbrella. Uh, I'm Kelly DuPont. I work for a group called Probitas Partners. 
and we're a placement agent. We help fund managers raise money, but just from institutional investors. People like you know CalPERS, CalSTRS, um, sovereign wealth funds, endowments and foundations, and the like. Um, we are active in private equity, in real estate, in infrastructure, and in private debt across all of those areas. We're a small firm, only 42 people. We have four offices. San Francisco is our headquarters, um, but we also have offices in New York, London, and Hong Kong. And we raise money for European and Asian funds, and also Latin American funds, as well as uh, U.S. funds. Um, graduated from Anderson in, in 81, began to work for First Interstate Bank when First Interstate Bank still existed, uh, and began to get involved in private equity there, managing their portfolio, private equity investments. Um, and Aurora was one of the investments that we had in our portfolio back then. Uh, and then moved on to work for a private equity consultant uh, doing due diligence for institutional investors like CalPERS was one of my clients, as well as in New York City p pension plans. Then moved on to the, the, the placement agent. But even though I help raise money, I always have sort of a, an LP's mindset. And I head up research at Probitas. And one of the primary areas that I'm focused on is what are LPs thinking? What, what are LPs? How are they looking at the marketplace? What interests them right now? Thanks. Um, I, I think you can see from the lineup we have a really good cross-section of, of, the, of the functions that really need to happen, with the exception of operations, which <coughs> is pretty simple in the private equity space. Uh, to make a successful firm. We did solicit questions from uh, a number of sources. Uh, we have given the questions to everybody on the panel, so there shouldn't be too many surprises. Um, so we'll just sort of, sort of kick it off here with ask, asking the first one and get the panel's take on where they think we are in the private equity market cycle. Um, and maybe you can just talk a little bit about also what do you think the private equity market cycle term means? It means a couple of different things. Yeah. Uh, clearly, there's a there's a capital raising cycle that I think we've seen historically, um, inflows into private equity and out of private equity, and historically, you know, I think you you have seen that to be somewhat cyclical, although trending up over the long term. Um, my my personal view, which you know may be different than other people's here, is that that is we're we're. The, the industry has matured to a place where it's probably going to be a little bit less cyclical in terms of capital flows for many reasons, for the results and expectations of public markets and people's expectations and hopes about returns, that we're probably in a state of sort of permanent oversupply of capital and private equity these days, which is, you know, as an investor, is a concern for me. So that's the, the first sort of cycle that we're seeing, that I think, is you know, sort of worked its way up and maybe to a permanently uncomfortable level. Um, the second cycle that we think about is uh, um, what's happening in the economic cycle, right? Um, and clearly we're at, uh, what are we going on now, seven or eight years since the last yeah. recession. So I think there are a lot of people that are holding their breaths or waiting for the next thing. Certainly as we're making investments, we're thinking about how much leverage we put on a company that might be subject to, to economic cycles. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that certainly is one consideration. Uh, and I think, you know, a subtext to that is what's happening in the leverage markets, how aggressive are the banks. Um, we're probably up at the higher level of that right now. So um, another thing to sort of be a little bit concerned and cautious about is uh, um, uh, how much leverage are you actually putting on your companies, what's available in the market, and should you be concerned about the, mixing that with the possibility of a, of a recession coming relatively soon. So um, those are sort of the, you know, the main things I think about when I think about the cycles, economic, about the cycles of our business. And in, in terms of the cycles, purchase price multiples also are, are, are at, they feel like they're at all-time highs. The most tangible evidence or facts we see are just how we price our deals. So we're looking at a purchase multiple and then ultimately an investment return. So internal rate of return. And, you know, it used to be that maybe it was 25% was your hurdle to to approve a new deal in your firm, whatever it was, I mean, those return hurdles have just simply come down. Um, or you're having to take more risk to get to that same return. So you're building more assumptions into what you think you can do with the business. Uh, we hear about other larger funds that will have a, a base case return of 12 to 15 percent, which 10 years ago would make no sense. Right. Um, and so I think that's another indication that we're, um, I don't know if we're at a top, but the industry has fundamentally changed if we're not at a top. Uh, and so how does that impact our approach? 
Um, I think you have to um, take more risk, do more things with the assets you own, uh, or accept a lower return. And so what are we doing? We are not willing to take incremental financial risk. So we are having to think about the things we can do with an asset that may be unique to drive incremental return out of that company. Uh, so it really forces you to go with your strengths. So what do you do best? Let's go back to those and really cherry pick the deals as opposed to having a wider approach. We could make money with that one or that one. Pick the one where we have the most conviction that we uniquely are the right owner for it. And you're forced to do that because there's five people standing there at the finish line uh, who all have the same view. I think one of the things you need to take a look at is when you say private equity, what do you mean? Right. Um, the buyout industry has certain metrics and you know, the purchase price multiples are all time high, dry powder is an all time high. That market really is tied to what's going on in the overall economy. Um, venture capital is a bit different. You tend to have a lot of funds focused on various aspects of technology or life sciences. Things really cycle in, in those markets depending upon what's happening in that specific industry. And these days, of course, when you're talking about you know, technology is a broad area, there's lots of funds that are focused on digital media. So you need to tell me what's going on in digital media before I can tell you what's going to happen to that fund. If you're talking about the biggest market, though, that's, that's buyouts. Uh, and to me, this has all the earmarks of, a, of us being at the top of a cycle. High purchase price multiples, high amount of dry powder. Now, the key thing about that is when you take a look at the private equity market, one of the things that drives the private equity market is fundraising. When the public markets reach some sort of an impasse and break, um, as they did with the, the global financial crisis, due to over leverage, especially in, in, in mortgage backs, uh, mortgage securities not having anything to do necessarily with private equity, as they did when the internet bubble burst, really driven perhaps by excesses in venture capital, but not necessarily in buyouts. When the market breaks, what happens is all of a sudden investors have less money to invest. The bulk of their portfolios are in public securities. Their portfolio goes down. All of a sudden, very quickly, they go from being under allocated to private equity to over allocated, and they stop putting money into new funds. So um, I, I, I don't think that we're done with cycles. Um, and the, the one thing that's really difficult is predicting what's going to be a trigger for a cycle. Um, if you take a look at, you know, in 2006, if you asked me, um, what do you think the impact of subprime mortgages is going to be in the, in the economy? My answer would have been, what are subprime mortgages? It wasn't really on the horizon as a big factor uh, uh, as it was. The other thing is, if you're taking a look at political risk as well, um, uh, Frexit. We've gone beyond Brexit. Now we're talking about French, France exiting the euro. If France ex exits the EU, that might be the end of the euro with all sorts of other knock-on effects. So one can never really predict what's going to be the trigger, but when that trigger happens, it tends to have a major impact uh, across markets. One of the key things, though, is um, if you take a look at it, if you take a look at private equity fundraising, let's just say buyout fundraising, and you can see the major cycles that have occurred, if you then map onto that vintage year returns, there's a negative correlation. Great years for fundraising end up being horrible years for making money. And one of the best years you could have, in, uh, uh, you, you could have put money into private equity, 2009, with the market collapsing around you, fundraising going right to the roof, uh, excuse me, right through the floor. And of course, what was happening? Purchase price multiples were going through the floor well, yeah, as well. That was a great time to invest. So you, know, you have to put all these cycles in, in, into context as to what it sort of really means for you. One of the things is if you're a newer a student trying to go off and get a job in private equity, um, when you do have fundraising drop off a cliff, people tend to not hire or lay people off. Especially, it's, it tends to be you know, first in, first out. So you know, from my perspective, you have to take a look at that as a danger point for you. Since Kelly opened the political arena, uh, we'll jump in and, and, and talk about What's your opinion on how the election of uh, President Trump has, has, has impacted or will likely impact the private equity industry uh, and the general private market markets going forward? I'm going I'm to comment on, on myself and our fund first and then you know, comment on more broadly, sure. which I'm probably less qualified to talk about it more, more broadly because I, I really think about it, how it has an impact on us. 
We invest it's okay in the to United be selfish. States. It's okay. We, we invest in the United States, and we're certainly expecting to have some kind of tax reform that's going to have an impact on the private equity industry. Exactly what that is is a little hard to tell at this point, but we have signals as to where it's going. We're likely going to lose deductibility of interest expense, and we're going to likely have dramatically lower corporate tax rates, right. which to a certain degree will offset each other, and depending on how much leverage you use, and what kind of deals you do can be a good positive for you, or it you know might yeah. be net neutral, or maybe maybe even a little bit negative. So, Look, and, do, and I'll just do briefly interrupt because I, I think a related point on the tax changes is most, virtually all private equity firms today that are private are structured as LLCs, right? And there's been a lot of talk about the new tax code that if some of the changes happen that they're talking about happening, that it would be advantageous to not be an LLC, but instead be a private C corp. Yes. So, and, and I'd get, love to get your views on that. Yeah, and it, you know, as a, as a smaller private equity firm uh, that's a partnership, that really is a partnership, yeah. and you know, you look at those moves and what they really do is they favor the big giant private equity monsters, yep. um, which, you know, is not all that surprising to me that that's where Trump is looking out for, right? It's, it's disappointing, but, um, but it's, it's not surprising. So. Yeah, we will, what are we going to do? I mean, I, we're not going to turn, we're probably not going to turn ourselves into a corporation. That, that's double taxation. That's not going to help us either, right? We're just not going to get the benefit that, that some of the larger firms are right. going to get, right? So um, we're, uh, but we are thinking about what that means potentially on a deal by deal basis and how much leverage you use on those deals. And you think about the cash flows, the, the, the free cash flow implications of that are significant. So um, that's probably the biggest area that the election sort of has an impact on so that we think about. We do have a lot of international exposure. Uh, we've already had that impact us in a couple of situations where deals have fallen apart, not, not permanently maybe, but temporarily because people want to wait and see the implications of border what, adjustment tax. Border or, adjustment yeah. tax. So I'd say that's very uncertain and unclear as far as I'm concerned at this point exactly where that's going to go. It has probably less of an impact on us as a media investor, right. media entertainment investor, right. but there are certain sectors, especially yeah. when we think about our, our IP fund, our royalty fund, where we're, you know, we're collecting royalties from all over the world, um, that, that actually, actually potentially has a pretty big impact right. and potentially a very positive, favorable impact if we can get the deals done. But now we have sellers that are realizing that there's potential positive implications of that and they're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure I want to sell until I, until I yeah. can reap the benefits of that. That's the way so, it works. Yeah. So I think um, on balance, it's probably better for private equity uh, under this administration, at least from the pers our perspective as our firm where we invest. We're U.S. focused. Uh, we have um, companies that manufacture in the U.S. are the kinds of companies that are either our investments or our customers of our investments. We own a business that we're almost done selling that provides um, chemicals to U.S. manufacturers. So when we were selling it, it was a feeding frenzy. And everybody had the same view. This is an opportunity to be a beneficiary of what uh, Trump is going to push, which is manufacturing in the U.S. So um, that's probably a positive. Um, we do have a company that their business model is we source product from China and we sell it in convenience stores, period. And so if there's a border tax, it will have an absolute effect on that business. And we've talked about that a lot, and it's just going to be a sales tax effectively for people that buy sunglasses at C stores, mm -hmm. which are going to be probably middle and lower class. And there's no way to get around it unless we can manufacture it cheaper in the US. So there will be a price increase that will be pushed through to, and that's just an example of the, um, the effects of that. But that, if that happens, that would be an impact. We'd probably be neutral. We actually might make money on that because you know, price increases um, usually have a net profit impact because your costs don't rise at the same rate and you can take advantage of that. Um, so those are, those are some impacts that we're seeing in our portfolio. And then the other thing is um, part of tax reform, which hasn't been discussed, is the, the uh, carried interest tax, which was during the, um, during the election season, Trump was saying, I'm going to, you know, the carried interest tax, that's the way um, uh, the profits of a private equity firm are taxed. And right now it's taxed as capital gains. And what was on the table was to switch that to ordinary income, which would be substantial. 
Um, that has apparently not reared its head recently. It doesn't mean it's, uh, it's done, but that would be a change in terms of the profitability of private equity model um, for, for participants in firms. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out. That apparently, I haven't heard any conversations around that recently, but I wouldn't be surprised if that comes back at some point. Well, I think that you're extremely early in the Trump administration. A lot of the economic team is totally not on board. Um, so that right now you have a lot of general statements that were made during the campaign, but what does that actually mean? Um, and you have to be careful about you know what it, what it means for private equity because um, even if you say they're going to end deregulation, what does that actually actually mean? How does that impact individual industries? You know, right now, if you're a healthcare buyout firm, and I differentiate that from life sciences, <clears throat> one of the things that you know, if you're going to we're going to throw out Obamacare and replace it with something else, what that something else was just sort of unveiled, but what does that really mean, perhaps, for the portfolio companies that you have that are dealing with Obamacare, have to deal with this shift or whatever? Um, Fracking, we're going to have less regulation on fracking, which means we could probably produce more oil. But we've already got a glut of oil and the prices are pretty low. So, you know, you know what, what does that sort of really mean overall for the industry? I, I think we're, we're, we're extremely early days. Um, and in my perspective, when, when, when we're talking to investors, even if you're just talking to investors in the States, investors in the States, when they invest in private equity, are investing in European funds and Asian funds, and some of them are investing in Latin America as well. And they're looking for a diversified portfolio. Um, and when you talk about you know, the border tax or making noise uh, on certain areas that may lead to a trade war, you know, what that really means if you're an LP with a diversified international private equity portfolio is really up in the air. Right. Since these two gentlemen are infrastructure people, I'll throw this one in, in your lap, Kelly. A couple people asked about what was the potential impact to the private equity markets of a $1 trillion infrastructure bill? Well, first of all, it's not a $1 trillion infrastructure bill. It's about a buck and a half from the federal government, and then we're going to get all these <laughs> private people to throw money in. One of the things, I've been following infrastructure for about 13 years now, uh, since it really began to be an institutional asset class. Um, and every year, um, you have people say, Infrastructure in the U.S. is broken. Uh, it's, it's falling apart. Uh, we need not necessarily to build new infrastructure. We need to, to the, the, you know, the 30-year-old bridges that are beginning to fall apart. We need to, you know, upgrade those now or replace those. Um, that conversation has happened year after year. Because of various steps that happened, you know, 30 years ago, a lot of the burden of, of infrastructure in the U.S. was shifted onto the states and municipalities. State and municipal, municipal budgets have been extremely stressed because a lot of obligations were also shifted to them. So you have um, states and municipalities that need money because they don't have enough of it to go off and, and build new infrastructure. The thing that happens though is when you propose, say, a new toll rule in Texas, what happens is that if it's, a, if it's a state government and the state government says, this is what we want to do, the party out of power tends to beat them over the head. No, this should be a public asset. It should be owned by the public. You shouldn't have somebody in the outside in the private sector make a, make a profit out of that. And I use the words advisedly, the party in opposition or the other party. It's not a matter of Democrats versus Republicans. It's the guys out of power hitting the guys in power over the head with something that they will get them votes, votes in the next election. So that there have been a tremendous number of large infrastructure projects that a number of private equity firms have bid on, um, that at the end of the day, after going through a, an entire RFP process, it was awarded to nobody. The government decided, well, no, we're not going to privatize this. So as far as you know, the infrastructure evolution in the states, the answer is always banana. Tomorrow yep. we'll get it done. Yep. And the key thing is, when, when you're looking at it, um, infrastructure is really driven by the states and the municipalities, not the federal government. So it, when you have, one of the differences is if you're looking at Europe, you've got 10, 12 major countries. If you're doing infrastructure pro projects in France, you need to be worried about what, what's going on in Paris. In the US, you've got 50 state governments and a ton of very large municipal governments as well that really sort of drive this process with very, very lo different laws in place that cover public-private partnerships. 
So when you take a look at all the, 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 the tactical impediments, I'm not sure, you know, you, you may say an increase. I, I'm not looking for a tremendous surge over the next eight years in infrastructure, no matter what happens. So eight years mean you're expecting a second Trump administration? Um, well, I'm not expecting a first Hillary administration, uh, in, uh, but I'm, okay. I'm not sure about this. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, the next, next question is, are there, are there sect areas or sectors that you find particularly attractive right now? And if so, what dynamics do you like about these sectors? So we're a sector-focused fund. We love our sector. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, um, this is easy. I mean, I could talk about this for three hours, which would make no sense. But we, we invest in media, entertainment, and communications. And if you... It's fun to talk about because we all do it every day. Right. We consume media entertainment every day. And if you think about what life was like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, versus what life is like today, you used to go out in the front porch and pick up your newspaper. You'd sit down at 8 o'clock on Sunday night to watch Desperate Housewives. And if you missed it, you waited till the reruns came on next spring, right? And now we live in a world where you get your news by the second delivered with your phone buzzing because some new news thing came on. And if you missed Game of Thrones last night, you can watch it on the way to work in the back of your Google car while it's driving you to work. So um, we have this incredible environment in media entertainment where there, there is a massively steep increase in consumption of media entertainment. And uh, more consumption means more dollars going into the space. And so that's really exciting because we have this incredible tailwinds behind what we do. Uh, what's even more exciting than that, though, is that if you scratch underneath the surface a little bit and think about it, there are some, going to be some big losers in that, too, right? There are business models that are getting turned on their heads. Newspapers fell off a cliff five, six years ago. Uh, and yet the industry is growing. And so if you can get in the right space in those industries, which is a lot of it is digital, almost all of it is digital, um, you can not only take advantage of the fact that the pie is growing really, really fast, but you can find little subsectors where the, uh, where the piece of the pie is getting bigger. So you're getting double growth. And, and that really is our strategy and what we do. I think that's good for another 10 years. I don't know what happens after that, but we're in still pretty early innings of that transition when you think about what life might be like in terms of your consumption of media entertainment 10 years from now. There's still massive changes that are gonna happen. We're moving towards an over-the-top model in television, skinny bundles, custom bundles. There's a lot of change, and where there's change, there's opportunity if you're, if you're smart and if you are a student of the industry. And, and so um, I always tell people this is one of those sectors where it sort of pays to be a specialist, where it pays to be sector-focused, and it's a place where people should have money because there is tremendous opportunity for outsized returns in, yeah. our, in our sectors. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so we're a quasi-sector focus. I mean, we have our sectors, but as I described, they're pretty broad. I can go through and explain what we look for and why we think those are attractive. And at the end, I'm going to tell you that other people see that as well, which means that pricing for the attractive assets and what I'm describing goes up and returns go down. So to answer the question, it's a little circular. I can tell you why sure. things are interesting, but I think a lot of people see that too. A good example is um, software and tech-enabled services, one of our three verticals, and we started investing there about uh, eight or ten years ago. And the pricing for deals in that space has just gone through the roof. So um, EBITDA multiples for transactions are in mid to upper teens in some cases, which is incredible uh, in context given the growth rates that you see there. But that's um, everybody's seeing that there's growth and stability of growth uh, and great cash flow and a very long secular trend that they can underwrite, and so they get excited about that. So um, we still find opportunity. What we are looking for in, in our verticals and what gets us excited is um, it's really um, finding an opportunity where you have a business that is good before we showed up but not optimized, and that's where we think we can add value, and that fits our risk profile. We don't want to step into a situation where the company has a risk that it could go to zero because of some industry change or technology change or something like that. We'd like our worst case to be that when we're done, if we totally failed, the business is kind of looks like uh, when we started. And then hopefully we can return our capital or something a little better than that. Um, and if we're right, then we've grown it substantially. And usually that, as I mentioned, includes adding to it through acquisition, um, 
new products, new geographies. A lot of our companies are just US based and by the time we're done we've introduced them to uh, outside the US. Um, we're usually adding to the management team. So we're finding those opportunities so it's a much more of a micro analysis of what's attractive to us within the three verticals uh, of um, especially manufacturing, industrial services, and software and tech-enabled services. I guess I tend to take a look at it differently as opposed to sectors. One of the things that I think that has a lot of impact on private equity is size, and that's fund size. The larger funds tend to invest in much larger companies. There's a different dynamic in, buy in buying companies which are already well established. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's more opportunity in, in the middle market. That may be a middle market sector focused fund, it may be a middle market generalist fund, but they're basically buying companies which are small, very often family owned and built up to a certain level. But they, they, there are definitely things that you can do to make a smaller company more efficient. Harder to do with, 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 with larger companies. Um, and so I, I tend to, to, to believe in trying to focus on that sector. The one thing about that is that um, this is a business which is driven by the ability of the manager. This is not a, you know, this is not a, a business where you can, in, in the public markets, you're going to do, you know, large cap value add. I'm going to invest in that, and then I can buy and sell out of it. You're going to be in investing in a, ma in a manager for, for a 10-year period of time, and there is a wide disparity of abilities between managers. If you're taking a look at, um, uh, in the public markets, so or if you're, look at, you're looking at mutual funds, the difference in performance between top quartile and bottom quartile managers is 500 basis points or so. The difference in middle market buyouts is 1,800 basis points. If you don't select the correct manager, you will get crushed. And if you take a look at the various sectors in private equity, th that's true across the board. Each one of those sectors has, has managers that are top quartile and bottom quartile. So you just can't say, okay, I'm gonna put money into healthcare and I'm gonna make money at it. It really is a, you know, a, a total focus to me on the managers. Yeah, I'd, I'd add that I, I completely agree about the, the, where you are in the market, the lower middle market in particular. We invest in the lower middle market, lower middle market deals, and you know, the opportunities there are tremendous. And we're not investing in broken companies, we're investing in good companies, but the good companies, healthy, growing companies that we invest in, it's amazing. They, they do almost zero business analytics. The ability to bring some discipline to those companies, it is, Low-hanging fruit. It, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, and that's the, the opportunity to drive performance in those companies, not just take advantage of the trends in the market, which we, which we think we get, but to be able to then <coughs> apply just a little bit of discipline, let alone the ability to make introductions and, uh, and, and expand the growth of their business through, through making you know, strategic introductions things, and things like that. The fact of the matter is, in those companies, you, you don't have an A-plus management team that has relationships with every company on the planet already. Right. They, they have very little selective relationships and connectivity and, and the ability to step in and do that. So we think about it in two buckets in those lower middle market companies. One, what can we do to step in and drive the revenue? And two, what can we do to step in and bring some discipline to the operations of the business, which is, and, and in both of those areas, in the lower middle market, there's tremendously low hanging fruit. Yeah. Good, thanks. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, a structural, a couple of structural things within the private equity, private markets business. Um, and I'm going to start with Kelly. So let me, let me try to ask the question that, that in, in describing that the typical fee, the typical fund structure today is a 2 and 20 model, which means a 2% management fee and a 20% performance fee, which then drives carried interest that we all have come to love so much. Um, and those are typically set up on a committed capital, fees are charged on committed, and then the capital gets drawn over time and invested. Uh, but there's some pressure on that model. And part one of the question is, how do you think that could potentially conceivably change in the future? How could it, in, uh, could it affect the co-invest model as it's done today, as we were talking about just before we came up here? And third part of the question is, given the increase in direct investing that we're seeing from institutions and Family office has always been a factor in that, but more so from institutions. What do you foresee in the next five to ten years and how the structure of the funds that you actually manage could change? I guess one thing is I would disagree that the, that the terms are 2 and 20. 
Two and 20 was what the terms were in the 1990s. Now, especially say if you have a billion dollar fund, the management fee is maybe 150 basis points. But it may be 140 basis points if you come in at the first close. It may be 130 basis points if you come in at the first close and you put in $50 million. So that the, you know, the, the, the fees certainly have been getting eaten away. The larger you are, mm -hmm. the more pressure there is on fees. Definitely. And that's because the larger you are, the more profitability comes out of the management fee. If you're talking about a $200 million fund, the management fee, which is probably still 2%, covers expenses. Right. That's the way the dynamic works. So, you know, the, there, there has, the market really sort of has fundamentally changed over the past 10, 15 years. Um, the other thing is when you're talking about in, investing on, on, on committed capital, um, which is the way a fund model works. You sign up for a fund, it's got a five-year investment period, it's got a, five, a total of a 10-year life statutorily, though the dirty secret is it actually lasts for probably about 14 years before you actually exit a, a, a everything. One of the reasons why that model works is that it, it's easier for a fund manager if they've got cash in hand with a check to do a deal, especially if there's competition. If you're working as a fundless sponsor, somebody who doesn't have a fund, and you have to raise the money deal by deal, you will very often lose out to somebody with a fund who can just write the check. Um, so the dynamic of that is, you know, when you take a look at some of the underlying things for why that structure was invented, um, I think that there, there's still a rationale for it. When you take a look at what's happening as far as direct investing, um, and let me separate that out. When you're taking a look at limited partners, most limited partners uh, are limited. They invest in funds. And one of the reasons why they like that is you have limited liability. Um, the general partner can get sued for a lot of stuff, but you can't. Uh, so there's a legal construct there which provides you a degree of protection. But if you really then want to go into direct investing, as an LP, you need to hire somebody with direct investing chops. And it's not cheap. About 15 years ago, uh, CalPERS tried to do more of things on the direct investing side. Um, and they tried to get permission to pay market salaries for direct investment people. Couldn't get it done. Doesn't happen. Now, the Canadians have managed to get that done. Nobody in the US has really sort of cracked that model yet. The Canadians have got that done, and the Canadians are going more and more to direct investing. A number of the largest investors there um, don't do funds anymore. The key thing is, when the Canadians invest, they're putting $150 million into a deal, $200 million into a deal. If you're talking about the middle market, that's you know, $150 million is what, five deals? You know, it's, it, it works at a certain scale. The scale that it works at is the area of the market that is most competitive, where you have a ton of people like Blackstone, KKR, Carlisle, with huge checks, not only from funds, but from separate accounts, investing. You've got the large Canadian invest, in, investing directly. You've got sovereign wealth funds like uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority investing directly. Um, and you, you're gonna have more and more activity there, which is actually what the, and the result is, at the larger end of the market, the, the, the trend already for the past 20 years is that returns at the larger end of the market have been squeezed down and down. They're gonna get squeezed further. There's still a lot of inefficiency at the smaller end of the marketplace, and I don't see a lot of that impacting the smaller end of the marketplace. It, it, it's just hard to do what middle market guys do right. uh, and, and, and invest billions of dollars. I, I agree that, that your questions are all interrelated. The other thing I would add on the two and 20 is that the more uh, fee sensitive in LPs are typically public pensions, um, can write larger checks, are going to larger funds. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they do a great job if they can get 1% fee for on behalf of their pension. Um, the folks that we tend to attract that are um, the middle market investors they could, that are a variety, um, but are writing, frankly, smaller checks, they may have different incentives themselves. They may be more aligned with our carry, actually, uh, and are not as sensitive to the fees. So we see the two and 20 model in a more pure form in our market. Um, there is pressure for sure on the actual numbers, but we have a two and 20 model period. Where it's interrelated with your question 
is that we offer free co-investment in every deal that we do. So we're really not two and 20 on all the capital we're manage, managing, but on our fund we are. But we have, uh, for 20 years, offered free co-investment to our limited partners in every single deal we do. Sometimes it's a very small amount. If there just isn't room, we solve for what the fund wants and needs to do its fiduciary. And after that, we'll, we'll give the rest to our investors. And they love it. Um, and that's a way for somebody who's paying two and 20 to pay one and 10. Um, and it allows us to scale our fund to buy a company that's this big or this big if we see an opportunity. So we actually like it as well. We get very close to our investors because when they do a deal alongside us, we send them our 100 page investment deck that represents one or two months of work and, um, and so they know exactly the quality of work we do. We spend hours on the phone with them, getting them comfortable with the risks. So when it's time to raise a new fund, they say, we know all your, investor, or all your investments, we like you guys. It's a very different underwriting process right. than if they're just saying, oh, remind me, Aurora is one of 50 funds in our portfolio. So you, it's a way to get very close to your investors. Um, that for um, our investor group is more and more important. And it, it is, enables us to attract investors because there are folks that have a very similar job to what I do that are sitting at an LP who do direct uh, investments and they do fund investments. And they use the fund investment as a hook to get direct investment. And that's where they make a lot of money. They will have carried interest on the deals that we do, just like we do. I'm curious of, of your limited partners in the commingle fund, what percentage of them actually do co-invest when co-invest comes along? Uh, by, by number of investors, call it half. By dollar amount, yeah, about, probably about half for both. Yeah, and then there's some- That, that strikes will, me as high. That strikes absolutely. me as high as well. Yeah, right. and, it, and there's, so what we'll tell folks is, we'll do it two ways. You can have a nice big chunk, if we have a $200 million equity account and we want to put up 100, we'll give you 10 or 20 million, but you got to do some work ahead of time. And if things don't work out, you take the risk on your time. So somebody has to have a job where right. they can sacrifice their time to make that decision. And, or, and, and how do you treat broken deal fees on that? Th that that's an evolving topic. Uh, <laughs> we uh, that is an evolving topic. We I'm eat setting it. you up here. Yeah, <laughs> we we eat it. Um, that's an issue. Yeah, the SEC doesn't like that. Right. They think that if you're working on behalf of co-investors, they should be eating some of the broken deal yeah. expenses. And that, that's, gonna, that's gonna come out more and more because that's part of, you know, the SEC is now auditing all of our funds. And so it's like each six months, there's a, a new hot button that they wanna push on and they're gonna fee somebody for yeah. it until it changes. And right now, one of the two or three things is that issue, yep. is who eats broken deal expenses. Well, but don't worry, in six months, they won't be doing any of this anymore. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> don't count on yeah. it. No, yeah. no more SEC. <laughs> On the fee thing, I, I agree it's bifurcated. The big funds are getting squeezed. The assets under management funds, as I like to call them, are getting squeezed in the, the middle market funds. I mean, we, we've raised three funds in the last five years and not ever had one LP raise the subject of fees in, in three funds. So uh, I just it's different for us. Um, as far as the co-invest goes, we, um, we probably now have about 90% that say they want to co-invest. Um, We've yet to test on the new fund exactly how many of them can do it. On the last fund, we had about 50% that said they wanted to co-invest and about a quarter of them, maybe about half of that could actually execute on a co-invest in a reasonably efficient uh, manner. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's mixed. It's mixed for sure. And we actually, as I said before, we, um, when we have a co-invest deal, we tell them up front, if this deal falls apart, you're taking your share of it. Good. One so, quick thing to throw in, there was an article in the journal sometime in the past week, uh, a writer was making a comment, you know, if you, if you read the financial press over the past six or seven years, it seems like, especially with the public pension plans, they're totally focused on fees, fees, fees. We have to pay fewer fees. And the woman who wrote this article basically said, well, you're investing for the return, aren't you? If you're going to get uh, back somebody who gives you a tremendous discount in fees, that's because they might not be very good. And what, you're, and what you're trying to do is make money off the investment, not pay the lowest amount of fees. Yeah, yeah we, we shared an LP that we dropped 
and I'm not sure if you guys dropped them or not, but I, I talked to John about this LP. This is a long time LP of ours. And they got all uppity about, not about a fee in issue, but it's about, it about a waterfall issue. It was the European waterfall versus the regular waterfall, right? And we were three times oversubscribed. And our returns have been, you know, our returns have been really good. And I said, look, you've we, been with us for 20 years. I would love to figure out how to put you in our fund. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll put some kind of you know, annual clawback provision or whatever, right? I'll try to help you. Nope, unless we have pure European waterfall, forget it. We're like, all right, good luck. What fund is gonna take you? Yep. How has being based in California impacted your fund? And I have, I have no, nothing in the sun since I'm in New York. So. Well, we're, you know, it's, we're invested in media entertainment, so being in California is a place to be for us. We're, right. you know, we are in the heart of it and, um, yeah, we have obviously higher tax rates for a lot of our companies, and we have higher tax rates ourselves because we live in California. But otherwise, um, you know, this is where the action is for us. So, you know, we, we could probably be in New York, but LA, quite quite honestly, is is better. Yep. So you guys have a good rationale for being here. We just we like the beach. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's I th I think it impacts us in a couple ways. Um, one is on the um, just a simple comment that. We happen to have about a third of our companies are here because you know there are businesses that fall into our verticals that are in Southern California, and you can say, "Hey, I happen to be in you know, whatever town in Southern California. Can I come in and say hi?" And you can build a relationship. So it's a way to to source deals a little easier. Um, I and I think that frankly, our competition, a lot of it is in New York, and we sell ourselves as the nice guys. So if a management team is meeting with five or ten groups, you know they're and when we come in, we just, you know, we're nice and we smile, and it's like a little bit of a relief from the three groups they just had from New York that are, you know, grilling them um, with a lot of attitude. And, and we hear that time and time again. It's just a different culture here. It's just a little more courteous. And I think, frankly, folks that, you know, live in the Midwest that have Midwest values really appreciate that. So that plays well for us. Um, the other thing is the human capital side. So uh, we, when we hire folks, we, make a commitment to them that you know we want them for the long term and they make a commitment to us and it's very different if you're in new york and you work in a private equity fund there are seven others on other floors in your building and you have an incentive individually to put deals on your resume so that you can then have mobility and trade to a higher paying job or a partner title or whatever it is so the incentives are aligned for you to transact so you can have mobility or at least the threat of mobility. Yep. If you're in LA, there just aren't that many places to go and we recognize that and so we are very careful to make sure that people don't create the, we don't create the incentives internally to transact, which has a whole set of issues. When you have the people who are closest to the information having an incentive to do a deal even if it's not in the best interest of your investors. So how do you structure an organization so the best decisions are still made when you have those incentives that could be working against each other. So we work a lot on, um, you aren't measured in our firm by the number of deals you do or even the success of, the, of those deals. It's, are you doing your job and the firm owns the results of those investments? And that is very much linked to the fact that we live in California and there isn't a lot of mobility around LA. And most people that come to our firm don't wanna, it's not like they're coming to LA to be in private equity um, they want to be in LA. This is where they want their lives. And if this doesn't work out, maybe they stay in private equity, maybe they do something else. They're not flying back to New York. Uh, so that's a very different proposition and it caused us to really look at our human capital model, yeah. frankly. Interesting. Okay. One of the things that's different about California is, is there are certain areas of specialization which are uh, prominent. In Los Angeles, actually, there are a number of distressed debt firms um, for, for whatever reason. Uh, that have sprung up here. And of course, because you have several large ones like Oak Tree, you also have people spinning off from those firms. So you, you create this sort of like virtuous cycle. Yep. Um, when people think of San Francisco, everybody thinks of the Silicon Valley. There are actually a lot of middle market firms in San Francisco, including a number in the consumer retail sector. And so th that San Francisco is a hotbed for that particular uh, uh, business. And actually, if you combine venture capital and middle market buyouts in San Francisco, it's probably, as far as a number of private equity firms, it's probably third in the U.S. after New York first, then Chicago. Um, a little bit surprising. 
Um, but uh, there certainly is, uh, California is an active market in private equity. Good, thank you. We're gonna do one more question for the panel and then open it up to the, to the floor for questions. It's kind of a broader topic that I'm, that I'm sure is of interest to many of the people in the room. Um, any, any concepts or thoughts you can give people on uh, coming out of business school and trying to land your first job and thinking about a career in private equity, how should you think about that? Should you go look bigger to do, do you really need to go to New York to get started, London? Is it San Francisco? How would you go about attacking it today, knowing what you know now, based on what you didn't know when you graduated? Call Aurora. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, so, you know, the, the, in the smaller markets like Los Angeles and, and San Francisco, although it's, you know, it's a good size, there's more, certainly more in San Francisco than in LA, but it really is about right place, right time, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there is, I mean, Oak Tree and, and uh, Aries maybe who have, you know, regular um, hiring cycle every year. I'm not, I'm not sure there's another firm in LA that, that is big enough that they're hiring somebody every single year, right? It depends on where they are in their fund cycle and, you know, are they growing? And, you know, that's about, that's about networking in as many places as you can, being in the right place at the right time. If you're talking about New York, then, you know, they're recruiting and there's a process and, you know, you can put your hat, your, your, your name in the, in the hat and go through that recruiting process. And, um, you know, hopefully the center here knows how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, I agree. It's it, it is right place, right time, and it's also what's attractive to us is is not necessarily what's attractive to other firms um, in terms of skill set and background. And and at any given time as well, we may want a particular background or personality and change our mind two years ago. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's one size fits all. I think um, you have to play to your strengths. Uh, whatever you have done historically in in your career uh, prior to where you are now. Um, try to find something that leverages that, um, whether it's an industry you worked in or relationships you developed while doing a particular job. Um, you have to leverage that because it's it's while it's an industry, it, there just aren't that many positions, especially if you're geography limited. So, um, uh, and the other thing is, you know, there isn't a set path. Uh, it's certainly easiest to enter it at a normal access point, like after you work in an investment bank or after you get an MBA or something like that, but that's not necessarily the way it always is. Um, it's circumstance. So, uh, you know, if it doesn't exactly work out the way you want, there's certainly a lot of opportunities to re-enter at different points depending on um, where you go. It's also dependent upon a bit upon what, what sort of firm you're interested in. If you're interested in venture capital, it's a weird model because you actually have a reverse pyramid partner heavy, very few junior people. So it's hard to get an entry level position and work your way up. You're better off, yeah, even if it failed, being the founder of a company that might have gotten on some VC's radar screens and work your way in that way. Um, um, buyout firms, distressed debt firms, are more susceptible to hire, hiring junior people where there's an entry point you can work your way up. Um, in the past, what you very often do would go to uh, an investment drank training program which lasted two years, then go off and get an MBA, and then go off and start, say, at a private equity firm. Um, most of the investment banks have actually tossed those training programs. So, you know, you're in a different position now because you, you've already got an MBA, but you, you, you saw that, you know, that issue of an entry point, especially in a, I agree with a market like LA where there's not too many firms. The one other thing that's also really key, though, is um, most firms, especially the smaller firms, are really partnerships. Um, composed of a distinct group of people that came together at some point in time, and they've built a certain corporate culture. Um, and if you get into a place where you do not fit into that corporate culture, it can be hell. Um, and trying to find out what really working at a particular shop is like is really difficult. Um, and to me, one of the, the only ways you can do that is try and reach out to some of the junior analysts who are there and try and get you know feedback from them, especially if they were, you know, somebody who was graduated from Anderson two years before you did, call that person up. Even, you know, you're trying to do fact finding. So they might not have a job, but you want to try and find out what it's like to work there. Uh, it can be hell if you end up at the wrong place. My question is around the LP base. So in the post-crisis environment, as you're going back to your LPs, raising a new fund, 
what sort of new demands are they having of the funds? What are their big hiccup points? And have you guys, other than fees, had to provide any sort of accommodations to continue the momentum going and, uh, and that sort of thing? I think that since the, the great financial crisis, um, most LPs have gone to a school that's run by the Spanish Inquisition. Um, that's the difference. Everything they can possibly ask you, they're going to ask you. The amount of due diligence that they do, the amount of written uh, paperwork that you need to submit um, has really ratcheted up tremendously, and that's sort of across the industry, across all, all, all the different pockets. Um, but then there are there are also um, specific hot, hot buttons they may, they may have in, 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 in terms and conditions, like, like the one you, you, that, that you were mentioning about going to a European distribution waterfall as opposed to American. But the odd thing about that is certain areas like that, it's not universal across the board. Um, what happens is either somebody at their board put that idea that they have to do it, and they know that if they bring that investment, to the, to the board, the board, that board, board, board member will veto it, so I have to have this particular clause, or it may be a clause where they got burned at, it at, at the past. And because of that, this is very, very important to them. It may not be very important to the rest of their peers. Um, and so it, 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 as you're going through and you're trying to ferret this out, it can be very difficult to know, you know how you're going to balance all this. Yeah, so I think it's a spectrum, uh, and it's a negotiation anytime you're raising a fund. So if you have a hot hand, you're going to have the opportunity to give less. You know, the European waterfall is all the money goes back to the investors before you take profits. The, I guess the American waterfall or the other waterfall is you could just take a profit on each deal on the assumption that all the deals work out. So you could be wrong and have a situation where you took too much profits early on. And then how do you resolve that? That's a change that has happened. Probably something that's more universally changed is the, um, yeah. the, the, the fees on top of the management fees. They're, there are you know, portfolio company monitoring fees. There's investment banking fees, transaction fees. Years ago, when you were a private equity firm and you charged those, you would keep those. And then you started having to share those with your investors. And now it's pretty much you don't get to keep those at all. It's just an offset to other fees. So you can collect them, but then they don't have to pay you some other fees. So in the end, you're still pretty much in the same place. Um, or maybe you keep a little bit. That's probably the thing that we've seen in, there are some funds that still have carved that out, but that's pretty much gone away from what we've seen across the industry. And probably makes sense too, honestly, yeah. right? I mean, if you, to be aligned with your investors, it's kind of odd to make a $5 million investment banking fee when you buy a company and haven't made any money yet. Well, the, the other thing when you're talking about alignment that, that has happened say over the past, probably even over the past 15 years from, from before the, the financial crisis is, that when partnerships were first structured, the standard partnership fee was a GP put in 1%. And to get further alignment of interest, especially if you're, if you're dealing with a GP that's working on fund six and who's made a lot of money in the past, what you want, what the LPs want to do is to have more money go into it. So now, you know, a two or 3% GP participation in, in the fund is, is probably more standard. There are some people out there that do something like 10%. Um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think KKR is just about to close in a $14 billion fund, and they're putting in a billion dollars as, as a GP participation. Right. So that, that, that really has come about. Uh, it's changed over the past 15 years. Um, but it's really sort of come about because then, if you have enough month, skin in the game, you're going to be acting just like the, the LP would want you to. And that's, that's where that's what it comes from. Could you talk a little bit about um, kind of continuity of funds and you know, planning for the next generation and you know, ways that that impacts your relationship with LPs and succession planning within your firms? We both have been through this, so um, we can talk about it uh, a lot. Uh, my firm has been through a generational transition. Um, there was a guy who founded the company with Roy Disney. He was the guy who was running the firm for many years. Um, he started back off and you know we were thoughtful about it. We thought about it many years in advance and it was a long, steady transition and it was very comfortable. By the end, our LP base was insisting on a shift, a shift in ownership, a shift in economics um, because they, they wanted proper alignment with the guys who were actually doing the work and managing their fund. And you know, fortunately, I was at a firm where you know, I'm not going to say it was perfectly smooth, but you know, we, we were able to sort of do that 
I think that, you know, having been through that, been the one that was underneath and went to the top, I now think about that, and our firm talks about that all the time, and we talk about that, I do talk about that with our, our LP base. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, but you know, I wanna make sure that the LPs get to know our younger partners and have confidence in them and realize who's, you know, that, that they're, they're strong, that our firm is strong. We're trying to build a partnership, not a firm that's based on one person. We're way past that, we're much bigger than that, we're much more stable than that. And we have to make sure we're communicating that to our LP base, that they understand that and they're comfortable with that. And we all need to make sure that we're living it as well. So, um, you know, I know that this has been an issue at, at many private equity firms. It's been the end of a lot of private equity firms because they can't make it through that transition. Um, you know, I have aspirations for the firm. It's, it's my legacy too. And I have aspirations for that firm to be going and doing what it's doing long after me. And so, you know, we're, we're very thoughtful about it and, and uh, yeah, we talk about it among ourselves as partners, and we talk about it to a lesser degree, but we do talk about it with our LP base as well. Yeah, our LP has really asked that we do it, um, that it be um, handled ahead of you know raising a fund. Uh, so we went through a very comprehensive process, uh, and you know, to 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 affect a succession plan. Um, and so I think that, frankly, is just it's it's more on the radar, partly because of where the industry is from just a time perspective. That founders of a lot of the firms are now at a point where uh, they're probably retiring, just given the where dates work. So that has become an issue. Um, it's also become an issue because some firms haven't made it because they didn't get through a transition. Strong personalities couldn't agree. Uh, things we're doing the same as what Steve mentioned. We, we are actively, as a result, thinking about our own succession planning uh, at all times. We do it in our portfolio companies. Why aren't we doing it for ourselves? So we, every meeting we ask, well, what's going to happen to the CEO if, if he or she isn't there? So we ask ourselves that. So we have redundancy on everything. Um, so any, any function other than sort of obvious investing stuff that you know, folks wouldn't see that's more operational to a firm, we have redundancy internally. If, uh, so two people are involved in everything. We have a group of uh, individuals who are either young partners or will be partners who are excellent, uh, and we expect them to lead deals. Um, we have things like two partners on every deal with the expectation that over time, the, more, the younger partner will have more of a leadership role. So there's still that mentoring and training, which is effectively uh, succession in a way. Um, and then the big question is, what do you, how do you solve the problem that plagues firms where you have um, a pie that's not growing and people that want to move up. And so you have to solve that. So you have to grow the pie or people have to retire or you have to get into new products. And we're thinking about that so that there's upward mobility for someone who's 35 and doesn't want to have their career capped once they're 35. It doesn't, whether it's economics or just satisfaction, they want to have more. I mean, the A types that are in this industry want more, more, more. Uh, and feel good about themselves. So we think a lot about solving that so people can be happy um, on top of the economic growth they can get. In, in, your, in any of your planning, have you talked about selling a stake in the GP? You know, that's a, it's a relatively new phenomenon, at least for anybody other than the very largest firms. There are now a lot of firms that are there are more than a small more than a handful right i don't know how many but probably less than 10 but more than five with many billions of dollars that are looking to invest and buy positions in gps specifically set up funds that are specifically like a private equity fund that's not investing in companies are investing in private equity firms that is probably in my view starts with guys that have five billion dollars under management maybe at this point may come down, that may work its way down. That's not something that, you know, we're at $2 billion in our management, so we're not really there. We, we certainly have, you know, we sort of are aware of it, and we talk about it, it's happening. Our partnership is not one where we think that's the path to transition, where we're gonna take somebody out. What I think the way we would rather do it, at least where we are today, is have the younger partners be able to come in and have some mechanism to buy out the older partners over right. time. Uh, and keep it as a private firm. That, that's our, our personal goals and objectives as we talk about it. But it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that's happening. And you know, as partners, we can't help but, but be aware of it and, and talk about what's going on and, and think of it as, you know, gee, that, that, that is an option, maybe, down the road. 
or it just or it just kicks the can down the road. Well, the, the other thing is though, yeah. that there, there's a related issue, which is what, if you're starting a brand new fund, you do have people that try and sponsor funds at, at that stage, um, and some of those people are also involved in in, in you know buying minority positions in, in in more more developed funds. But one of the key things is if from from an LP's perspective you want to make sure that there's enough carried interest in the firm going to the partners to keep them involved. And this is so that any time more than 25% of the carry is paid away to an outside sponsor, that becomes a hot button issue for LPs. Mm -hmm. um, most of the, the current uh, purchases of more developed firms have been more 10% stakes, but it's not been unusual for people to try and sponsor a new fund to try and get up to 50% of the carry. The other thing is if you try and put if the sponsor tries to put somebody on your investment committee, that drives LPs nuts. Because then they have to do due diligence on you plus the sponsor. Uh, and if the sponsor is gonna be a major investor in the fund as well, there's all sorts of potential conflicts that wind up and it can be tur turned into a real mess. Am I right, Kelly, that that's really not, that's really a maybe $5 billion and above where that's happening today. No, if, if, you're talking about, if you're talking about buying out established funds, taking a minority, minority position established yeah, yeah. funds, that's, the other one you're talking about- so Starting producing, from scratch. Yeah. Backing some, a, new, a team that's spinning out someplace and backing them and getting a piece of the, right. of yeah. the carry, yeah. yeah. Okay, time for one more question. Could you discuss from the LP side how they kind of vet the managers as they're considering investing in a new fund and the process that that entails? Okay. Um, the first thing to say is, um, LPs are not in the process of running a, running a university. They don't want to pay to train you to be a GP. They want to make sure that if you're, you're, you're pulling together a group, that the group has an attributable track record. Usually you've worked at, you know, as a junior person at some other fund, but you've got an attribution to certain deals. And by attribution, private equity is a, is a cooperative business. This is, well, on this deal, I helped um, source the transaction. I helped do the due diligence. I helped negotiate uh, the, the sales agreement. I helped with the financing. I served on the board. In some, in, in some of those things you might have done on the deal and some of you might have, might, might not have. But you need to have, be able to show, yes, I know what I'm doing as far as an investor. Um, that's key. Now, if you're spinning out all from the same organization, you can probably demonstrate that you work together. If you're bringing people in, from various places, and the question is, is this a team? LPs back teams, not uh, groups of individuals. Um, and I know of a, a situation it's just two years ago, um, a group of three people came together, um, and they actually were spinning out from one particular organization. Um, but uh, they went through the fundraising process. They were trying to have a, a one and final close. They got down to the final close, and one of the three partners said, you know, <laughs> I'm not really an entrepreneur. I don't want to do this. And, you, and that ended up burning the bridges for all those three partners with a lot of LPs who had spent a lot of time and work investigating them to make that decision. And all of a sudden, you know, th this opportunity that they spent a number of man hours <coughs> with blew up on them. Um, you know, besides that, being a team, uh, having a, a, a track record that's attributable, they want to make sure that you're properly structured that there are incentive programs in place that incent the team, that you have all the key people there that you need. Um, one of the things you actually can do these days more and more is outsource the back office. There are organizations where you can do that. But if, if you tell somebody, well, me and Joe here are gonna be the, the two lead investing partners, along with another person I can't mention, he's gonna come on board at the first close. The response of the LP is, well, come back to me when you've had their first close. You can tell me who that guy is. Why should I make the decision to back you when I don't know that, that person? So it, these are the kind of things that, that, that are important and, and that LPs focus on. They focus on a lot of other things, but those are the real keys. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. Thanks, guys.